This episode is sponsored by HPress Cloud. They are dedicated to helping you create an internet presence for your brand, your business, firm, and anything you can think of that can have a website. HPress Cloud gives out lifetime.com domain registration to its customers. You can check out my website, nabguzichwanka.com, to have an idea of what you too can get from their services. For more information about their services, visit hpress.cloud. Welcome to Hashtag with Navguzi Chuanuka. This is a place where we help you unravel social constructs, discuss self-development in line with mental health, emotional well-being, and everything in between that directly or indirectly affects us in the millennial world around us. If you're hearing my voice for the first time and are the kind of person who is not scared of being a better version of yourself even if it requires you to contradict who you were 24 hours ago, consider this your virtual home. I'm your host, Navguzi Chuanuka, and I cannot wait to engage with you in the various conversations. This Wednesday, I'm in conversation with none other than the person whose name is synonymous with gratitude, Catherine Nyahanga. Nyahanga runs Gratitude with Kath, a blog she created to help cultivate healing and hope through gratitude. Her sharings call for us to bloom where we are planted. And in this conversation, she and I explored parenting from a safe and healthy space, anxiety and the power of being present, how gratitude impacts our emotional and mental well-being and the importance of changing the way you speak to yourself. If there is something that resonates with you during our conversation, please share with us on social media using the hashtag HTNK in session. Here's our conversation. Catherine Nyahanga. Hi, Nabuguzi. Welcome to Hashtag with Nabuguzi Chiwanuka. Thank you. Thank you. I feel so honored to be here with you. The very first time I saw your name, I don't know how long back, I was like, Nyahanga, Nyahanga. Is she from the West? She, because I was like, <laughs> you know, you know where, I don't know if it's Lunyankoli, where mm-hmm. you say Byayanga, like it has failed. <laughs> it oh has God. refused. <laughs> so I was like, could she be coming from this side? But then when I look at your features, I'm like, she's not, but, but maybe she is. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> <laughs> I found out now. I could be from all over the place. <laughs> so what does the name mean? What does Nyahanga mean? So, Nyahanga is actually an adopted name. Um, I have a foster father who is Jaluo from Kenya, and his last name is Nyahanga. Mm-hmm. And so, I, when I took that name on, he said it meant bush. Oh. Literally, it meant bush. And then I have a very fascinating story about that. So, when I was young, uh-huh. during the LRA war in northern Uganda, my mom is actually right? You were present. Uh-huh. I was right. Like I heard about it when I was when I was young. Well, I was a baby. I was a baby. You were in the area. Oh yes. So my mom worked with Caritas, you know, the so-called UN and the collections of, and she was far away, and we had a nanny at home who was taking care of me and my twin brothers. I have a twin brother, mm-hmm. and apparently I was a very chubby baby. I was big. Yeah, very big rolls and everything. And so the nanny that was carrying me was running from the gunshots, right? But I was so heavy. She couldn't run fast. So she dropped me. Oh, (laughs) yes. She dropped me under this big mango tree. And my mom came back the next day and found me. And so my foster father said it it meant bush. Yeah, it made so much sense. Like, you know, I was meant to have this name. She abandoned you. She dropped me. I was (laughs) dropped. I was dropped and she left me. But so how long were you there? Like 24 hours? Oh, yes, yes. My mom came back the next morning and apparently she wrote a whole will and everything um, in case she didn't make it back. (laughs) But she came back and she found me. I'm very grateful, you know, that she did. What you said, you have a twin brother? Yes. Where was your twin at the time? He was skinny. Where was he? So, she, so the the so, help went with the other yes, skin. Yes. So, <laughs> oh my goodness! You know, like two two arms. So I was on the right. And Fat was on shaming, the left. Right? right from the start. Right. <laughs> oh. Yeah, but <laughs> I met her years later, and she cannot stop talking about how chubby I was. It's like you dropped me. Like, you know, if I died, that would have been murder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, I'm 
and I'm here. I'm very grateful. And my foster dad, you know, played a big role. And so I took on that name. Am I pronouncing it right? Is Nyahanga. it Nyahanga? Yes. Nyahanga. Hey, Nyahanga. Because right. <laughs> some, 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 some tribes have a twist or languages have a twist to something. Mm-hmm. So tell us about who Nyahanga is. Well, Nyahanga is a mother first. I have two beautiful daughters. Um, I'm a daughter to a wonderful woman. I'm very grateful to my mom. Is that O? I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> that is a very tough question. Is it? Because when you look I'm, at yourself, what do you see? How would you, if get out of your body now, who oh. is Nyahanga? How would you describe her? Oh, I'm very complex. <laughs> I am a force. You know, I trust in myself. When I look at myself, when I wake up in the morning, I see myself as, first of all, I'm a provider. You mm-hmm. know, my daughters are a big reason as to why I am as fierce as I decide to be every day. And, you know, it's, it's really, it's a very tough question when you, when I'm asked that because complexity means so many things, mm-hmm. right? And some people will say I'm a mother. Some people will say, you know, I'm a daughter. <laughs> I'm a sister, but I'm a mother to many and not just my children. And so, you know, every day is lived with gratitude and for the person that I am. I can't put a name on it. <laughs> You're waiting for a name. I can't put a name on it, you know. And from the time, how how old were you at the time when you were dropped in the bush? Oh, Christ. Maybe nine months old. Nine months? Yeah. And after that, did you stay in the village? Did you stay in uh, Gulu? Um, oh, yes. My, my, my mother. So this was in Kitgum. At the time, yes. And my mom moved to Gulu and we lived in Gulu up until I was about 10 or so. And then this was the first time I actually met my dad. So, you know, when you're young and... The first time. Yes. And my, my mother and my father were never together. And so my father was missing in the picture and I missed him. You know, mm-hmm. I think it's this daughterly or fatherly thing. It's like, I need my dad. I want my dad. And so, you know, when I realized he was alive, I was like, I need to see my dad. Like, I need to go see him. When you realized he was alive. <laughs> yes. I mean, at the time it was There were no conversations. No, there was never a conversation. And I, and I think it was because it's such a, it's a ritual. It was a known thing for men to just have children and leave the homes and the mothers never talked about them. Or... So you had seen a couple of families without father figures? Mm-hmm. There were so many of us that didn't have a father figure. But, you know, and the movies don't make it any better because you think that you, you know, you're not perfect because there's this missing link. But I remember when I told my mom, I, I need to meet my dad. And of course, you know, we left and we came to Kampala and I met my dad and I lived with him and my stepmom, you know, who I'm still struggling to forgive for a lot of things that, you know, happened. But as a child, when you're growing up and you don't have the father in the picture, there's this idea in your head that you think that, you know, your mother is at fault or they're hiding your father from you. And until I actually got to meet the man, there was this idea in my mind that, you know, <laughs> my mom is just deliberately trying to keep us away from our father. Yeah. You know, and, and when we had these conversations, you know, you'd look at your mom and you're like, why are you hiding my dad from me? And she'd look at you and say, you'll get it when you grow up. And until then, you actually would not get the picture and you're like, well, you're the evil person. Mm, mm, mm. You know? And I mean, the, the, the period when you're having some sort of fights. Right, right. <laughs> like, you're like, the terrible person. Right, like, I'm going to tell my dad. And, and, you know, and then I actually got to meet him. I barely spent time with him up until I was... So I left home when I was 12. So when I met my dad, I was 10. And then I left home when I was 12. And I went back to my mom Mm -hmm. because, you know, home wasn't really home. It wasn't what I pictured it to be or what I had imagined it would be to... to What you had longed for. Yes, what I had longed for wasn't, you know, what was being given to me anymore. And my dad would leave for work and come back late in the night. And so I'd sneak late at night and like spend time with him when he's watching the basket mouth show. Um, but that is pretty much all I remember of him, you know, sitting there quiet at night. And I think I called him multiple names too until my mom corrected me one time and said, no, that's not his real name. <laughs> this is actually his name. Whoa. Yeah. So, you know, the presence of a parent 
has a great impact Mm -hmm. on children. And if you sit back and actually think of it, each child or children that are that have grown up with a single parent have different outlook of the world than those that actually grew up with both parents. Yeah. And it involves a lot of healing and trauma and you know, some stay stuck in blaming, but it's really hard. Or questions about what don't I deserve this? Mm-hmm. This kind of self sabotage. Right. Yeah. The, the talk of fairness and unfairness and what you deserve versus what you got. And you get stuck in that mm-hmm. you know, for a really long time. Mm-hmm. But when when you look back and think of it, you know, you're you're who you are because of those experiences. You know, you are if you did not go through certain things in life, yeah. you can only imagine where you'd be. Sometimes I wonder too, if I had only made different decisions, where would I be today? Yeah. So, you know, you Stay grateful and grounded in what you know. Before the age of 10, mm. what did your hunger look like? <laughs> My God, I was skinny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you just, you just lost the rolls oh, just like that? Oh, I did. I think it was some, I don't know. <laughs> I was so skinny. I was skinny growing up. I was so tiny. Um, and then there was that talk of, oh, if you're skinny, you're sexy and beautiful. <laughs> Bef- below the age of 10? Oh, no, no, no. When you're a teenager now. Like, I'm talking to <laughs> Because I had asked you about the age of 10 and I'm like, wait, what? No, no, I jumped it. No. <laughs> but to be honest, I have very little memory. And I think this is on purpose. Um, I have very little memory of my childhood. I don't remember actually being a child. I don't remember playing with my peers. I don't remember, you know, running up and down or jumping ropes. I actually don't play I do not have any childlike attributes, unfortunately. And I say unfortunately because it is so empowering when I see, you know, people experience being a child. Like the Quipina game, for instance. Yeah. When this happened, this was in 2019, I believe. I was actually here in Uganda. And my friends, um, Simon being like, mm-hmm. he, he was like, hey, I'm going to go play Quipina. And I remember having this conversation with him and it's like, oh, okay, have fun. (laughs) It's like, you should come. And I'm like, (laughs) no, I can't. And, you know, we talked about how I definitely do not have any childlike behaviors. And it's, it's not like it's a bad thing. It's a beautiful thing. One should, you know, experience being a child. And, you know, when you grow up and you're still an adult, you should still have these attributes because it's, it's, it's just who we are. We should have it. I just don't have it. I, I really don't. I have two beautiful girls. Um, I spend time with them. I play with them. But I always, you know, feel much better for them when they're playing with people that actually, you know, like I get down and roll down with them, but I don't jump, I don't run. And I don't like to, I don't want to, because to me, it feels like triggers, You know, I run a lot as a child from, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) You know, rape. um, And I'm I'm comfortable talking about that. It's Mm -hmm. not something that hurts anymore. But when things happen to you as a child, when you grow up, it's just, it's different. There's like a stop to it. So unfortunately, I really do not remember much of my childhood. (laughs) So when you say 10, I'm like, eh. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I've had conversations, people's conversations or content about how there is something called selective memory Mm -hmm. where it's more like a trauma reaction or Mm -hmm. response where people just choose not to remember some things. Mm -hmm. So should we look at teaching that light? Most likely. You know, there's a high possibility. There are certain things that I will remember vividly, you know, to the core. and then Is that like in childhood? Like some most few moments? Of, yeah, most of my childhood. I do remember a lot of things, but I genuinely cannot easily talk about them. And even if I sit down and, you know, I'm asked a question about my childhood, for instance, I cannot simply tell you exactly what it is because I genuinely don't remember. And maybe I choose to not remember subconsciously, but even... Right now, I feel blank, you know, (laughs) memory-wise. So if you ask, you know, if it's selected memory, it could be, you know. 
Most likely. <laughs> Most likely. <laughs> Most likely. And then you talked about coming from your father at the age of 12. Mm-hmm. What was that like? Did you, uh, did you feel like, because this is someone that you missed mm-hmm. and longed for, and now you're working away from his premises. What was it like in, your mo- in that moment? Is it more like a place of relief or something like, ah, no wonder. Mm, it wasn't no wonder because I had no idea what I was getting myself into. It was more, it was a lot of regret, but it also gave me a different picture of what my mother actually was experiencing. And my father, he's a good man. He's a really good man. Now, the woman he was with, that's a whole other story. Um, she was not open to other children that my dad already had. And we were many, we were so many from I different do, women. From different women, yes. Wow. Um, he's a Muslim. I do not identify with any religion whatsoever. But he tried his best. You know, speaking of control, per se, it felt like he was not in control of his own life. And that, you know, this woman in particular sort of had more control of who he was mm-hmm. you know, and who we spent time with. And it had so happened, I had come from school. I went to Jinja Centro school at the time and it was my first time to come back home by myself because I didn't know the roads so you know I jumped on a bus and then after the bus I jumped in a taxi and I went to this woman that I had met um an aunt apparently an aunt also means your father's other you know (laughs) at the time as a child of course. Did I, you know the relationship? I had no idea. I thought she was my father's sister. And so, you know, I branched by because I didn't know where to go. It was getting late. And it's like, could you call dad? Because I don't have dad's number. And sure enough, she did. But my uncle came to pick me up. And it turns out my dad was not home and he left his phone with my stepmom. And she was the one that picked up. So my uncle in the car was telling me, well, I need you to be very strong because I know we're getting home and um, she's going to, you know, she's going to whoop you, at, you know, Bagenda <laughs> yeah, Kukuba. It's like, yeah, okay, yeah, all yeah. right. And, and so we get home and I'm like, why does she want to, to beat me? Right? And so she starts to, she was very aggressive. She hurt me a lot, a lot. And so I ran away late that night and unfortunately... You the know. very night you yes. left school. Yes, the very night I left school. And so, yeah, I got myself back home on my own. It was it was really it was really hard. It was and this is this is something that I'd not even told my mom, you know, but when I left it was more anger. You know, it was like mm. you're not here to protect me. It is your duty as a parent to protect your children. And if children do something that make a parent angry or upset it shouldn't be you know violence doesn't teach a child anything whooping a child only instills fear you don't want your child to fear you Mm -hmm. you know especially a girl child you want your children to confide in you because if something happens to them they can easily tell you what is going on versus running to a stranger or an aunt or you know, and then other people get to hear stuff that is actually hurting your child that you don't know of mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because you've instilled this fear. There's a thin line between respect, you know, and fear. And so, yeah, <laughs> it was so much anger when I left home. And so when I reconnected with my father, this was actually three years ago. Um, three years ago. When I reconnected with my father. That is a space, that is after a space of how many years? About seven or eight, I believe. Very no, that's a very long time, more than a decade. Jeez, because then in between, I got married, had two kids, and then I divorced. And <laughs> and he's not part of that. No, no, and he only got to like go through or feel, you know, and get to know me as an absolutely different person. And I'm also getting to know him, you know, on a different, on an intimate level that I never did as a child. Mm. And so, mm. you know, when I tell him the things that I'd been through as a child, he's in shock. He is in shock. Right, because he had no idea. He is not dismissive of the fact that she struggled. No, mm-hmm. no, he, he was more like, I am extremely sorry that I didn't know, that I didn't do my best to stay present and to understand and to be a father. And I think this is, this is like, for me, 
that is beautiful. Mm-hmm. You know, to hear from him that, listen, your pain, I value, like I understand, I validate the things that you felt and I'm here for you. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's a working progress. We're not yet completely together. It's a stage. Yeah. It, it, I mean, you're coming, you're, you, you get to see some parents, mm-hmm. pe- present parents that is, and a child cannot even have a conversation with them, you know? Or even when a child talks about their experiences, they are so quick to dismiss them. Mm. which sometimes may not really be their intention, but we're not open to having such deep conversations. So you get to find that someone is like, I would rather dismiss you Mm -hmm. (laughs) than have this introspective conversation. That is really hard. And I'm, I'm raising my children very differently. And I'm going with, you know, the picture of, I need to end my generation of trauma. My children... Mm will feel a whole different kind of love and they will make decisions on their own when they are ready. But until then, I will love, guide, support, protect them the best way that I can so that they never get to go through the things that I went through. Some of the things that I went through could have been prevented had I spoken of, you know. But for you given space to do that. No, No, there was no space. Mm -hmm. And when my daughter comes to me, you know, and she's like, hey, mom, um, I'm going to give you a good example. My ex-husband and I are not exactly best friends. Right. Um, but there are certain things that we cannot change. This is we have two children that we amicably have to raise. And, you know, so when she comes to me and she's like, hey, mom, um, I would like to talk to my dad. And I'm in a space where I know I can't at the moment or I'm using the phone or I'm busy. And I'm like, well, mama, give me a few minutes. I'll, I'll get back to you. I'll let you know. And so she understands that if she gives me that space, I'll get whatever I need to get done. And then I'll make sure that she has that conversation that she needs to have with her father. Because there's no need in me trying to prevent that relationship. Right. Right. So just because two elephants are fighting doesn't mean the, el- the, the grass has to suffer. You, you know speak I mean? on that. Huh? You, you know, when you, I know the, the kind, that, that proverb the two elephants proverb. Oh, I think it's a, if the, when two elephants fight, the grass the, gra- is, the grass is the one that suffers. Right, but but in this case, I don't want the grass to suffer. I understand. And this is the beautiful creatures that we decided to mm, bring mm, here. Mm, mm, and mm. so, you know, at the end of the day, it's how do you intend on preventing that generational curse? And you know, I don't want my children to have any relationship trauma. And I'm talking about family trauma. It will not come from me. If my child ever goes through some sort of trauma, it will not come from me. Mm, mm, And I'm mm, making mm, sure mm. of that. Do we get to look at the moment where your mother allowed you to go to your father as something that you feel like you had to do for your children? I think so too, but I was also a very rebellious child. I think that, you know, had I only listened to my mom, talking of, you know, decisions that we made that would make us not get somewhere. And in this case, had I listened to my mom, I wouldn't have, for instance, gotten raped, maybe, right? Had I listened to my mom, I wouldn't have developed this emotional burden that I carried for years, this, this, um, you know, what do they call it? The the father thing, daddy Uh, daddy issues. issues. Right, I most likely would have had a whole nother way of looking at it versus the needy girl, the, the clingy child that is trying to replace a certain figure with, you know, the neediness of love. But, you know, I'm still grateful that she let me experience this on my own and, you know, allowed me to come to conclusions that I was aware of because I was a very, I was a very curious child and I asked questions and I came across this post one time that said confusion is better than certainty because we're not always certain. And when you're confused, you're in a state of mind where you're asking questions and you want to know and you're curious Mm. versus when, you know, you're certain, you're like, no, I know it. You know, I know everything. That's not true. We can't always know everything. And it's always better to, you know, be confused and to be curious to know better than to shut off the opportunity to learn more with the, idea of I know best I know it all I don't need to know anymore Mm -hmm. so 
Yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful to my mom. I, and these are conversations that I eventually actually had with her. And she was in shock too, because she's like, damn. Oh, child. she too wasn't aware. Oh, yeah. She was like, oh, dear. <laughs> so you kept these. This is you, a preteen. Yes. You kept these with yourself for all this while. Mm hmm. And until you had, I don't know, did you, was it until you had your own children that you started having this conversation with your parents? Yes. Yes, until I started seeing that I want better for my children. I can handle the pain. I'm healing from the pain. And my dear, it is hard. The process of self-healing and learning and unlearning the things that we were taught or the things that we thought we knew mm -hmm. is difficult. And when someone tells you, I need you to heal, it's not easy. And it has to come from a place of want versus need. You need to want it enough to go through it. And that involves a lot of vulnerability, you know, and the things that you and I can easily talk about. Most people, you know, might call it blasphemy. They might say, well, you can't speak of these things because... You shouldn't. Well, mm -hmm. why can't I speak of my pain? Why mm -hmm. should I only share how much joy I feel when I go through something versus when I'm in pain? Why can't I tell you, listen, I'm not okay. Mm -hmm. And it's your place to either say it's okay to not be okay or to just listen and let me be in my pain for a minute. Because when I'm in my happy mode, when I'm happy and joyous, everyone is okay. They want to be a part right. of it. Everyone wants to be a part of your joy. But when you're broken and you're not okay and you're like, listen, I am not okay. Just listen. People are not open to just listening because everyone is quick to saying, well, you man up. Well, you have children. Well, the, my children. Be a strong woman. Right. Be a strong woman. Well, I am exhausted from being strong. Mm. It mm. is hard being strong all the time. And this comes in when, you know, with me, it's from childhood. I don't remember being a child because all I've had to do is be strong. Oh my God. Right. And so in being strong for other people and yourself, there is no space to be anything but that. Right. But then when you learn that, listen, I can be more. I am okay being weak. <laughs> like I want to cry. Mm -hmm. I'm going to cry mm -hmm. and I'm not afraid of it. <laughs> And so you're either going to cry with me yeah. or walk away mm, mm, because this mm, is how mm. I feel today. Right. Staying in that situation is what brings in the frustration, that long-term position where you're just stuck. Yeah. And you don't know what to do with yourself because you're not allowing yourself to feel these emotions. You're not allowing yourself to grow and just get over it because all emotions are temporary. Mm. Right? Like we yeah. fall in love, we fall out of love, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you need to work hard to fall in love with your partner over and over again. Over and over again. People give up and that's We great. don't like the process. No. We don't like the process. <laughs> no one likes that process. We just want the dopamine shot all the time. Mm -hmm. well, mm. That stuff wears out, you know, and so it's a process. Mm -hmm. Heal. Mm -hmm. Heal as much as you need to. And that's when I started writing. I actually started, I started writing a long time ago and I have about 26 journals. Could that be because you're silent? Yes. Fist bump. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we can't treat each other. Oh. <laughs> I'm sending you kisses from here. <laughs> you know, I can really relate to that. I was silent for a couple of years. Like I was wild on the outside, but I couldn't really talk about myself. Mm -hmm. So for the things that I felt deeply, I would put them in writing. Right. So even when it came to expression of love, I was writing my mother letters when you were staying in the same house. Oh. I could only write and then place the letters under her pillow. Mm. So I couldn't really understand. These, these, these got to be released one way or another. Mm -hmm. Because when you stay stuck or, you know, and then it grows into resentment. And then you start to sit and overthink everything. Mm -hmm. It's like, why am I in so much pain? Could it be? Could it be? Well, what if every day something that you went through, this is journaling, right? If you woke up every day and the feelings that you're feeling is written down, I'm grateful that I've woken up today. I'm grateful that 
I get to go to work, that I have a consistent paycheck, that yeah. I'm I'm not starving. I am able to feed myself and my children and my family, you know. And you have a horrible day, you come back home, write it down. I had a wrong, you know, today was not the day that I looked forward to. It was horrible. Mm-hmm. Could, it, could I have done it differently? Maybe. Could I have done it differently? Right. But mm. what is the point in staying stuck in thinking, could I have done it differently? What is done is done. You can't undo it. Can we check with tomorrow and yeah, see what can come right? out of it? Like what is done is done. What can I do better tomorrow? You know, how can I react differently Mm -hmm. to certain things? You know, so it is hard. (laughs) Being a human being is difficult. (laughs) Well, the dogs can't speak for themselves, so we don't know. (laughs) It is really hard. The animals can't say, they might also be talking to them, so like, oh my, being a dog is hard. Mm -hmm. No, no, no way. No, being... I so I spoke with a friend of mine and it was just this conversation. It's like, what would you be in a different lifetime if you had a choice? Mm-hmm. He said, I would love to be a dog. <laughs> <laughs> but what was the reason? But he emphasized, he said, I need to be a dog owned by a white man. Oh, mm-hmm. <laughs> pedicures on time, you get to eat <laughs> all the food you want to eat. Belly rub, oh, yeah. you know, a nice grooming. That's massages. Like, and they treasure animals more than they treasure black people. Oh, Most goodness. of them do. But <laughs> I don't think they see it that way. And, you know, opinions again. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, but he would love to be a dog. And I thought about it ever since then. What would you want to be? Oh, my goodness. An oak tree. A tree? I think I'm a tree. I actually resonate with the oak tree, or in this case, a phoenix bird. We'll get to that. (laughs) We're going to get to that. (laughs) Uh, You've talked about being spiritual, not subscribing to any religion. Right. What could have inspired that? So being spiritual is more about being aware, right? Mm -hmm. So we speak of our people that, our Christians and Catholics talk about being kind and being spiritual is more about treating people the way, the way you want to be treated. Right. You know, it's, it's, it has a lot to do with a karmic experience. And so when you're kind and you treat people the way you want them to treat you, it's you open yourself to a whole another energy and awareness of versus if you're stuck in, I believe in one religion or I believe in, and this is not to condemn people who believe in what they believe in. Right. You can't, but I'm not, you know, I'm not that way because I choose to be, you know, at the end of the day, I am a good person and I treat people the way I want them to treat me. Mm -hmm. And for me, that is more powerful than anything. Right. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to understand at what point did you feel like, you know what? I don't have to identify as anything. Because we're looking at you talking about your father being Muslim and Mm -hmm. you not being that. No. My mom my mom actually used to be a nun before she had us. Hey. Uh (laughs) (laughs) Uh-huh. Oh my god. Oh yes. Did you ever have a conversation with her? A long time ago. About Uh, leaving. No, no, she left before, before she had us. So this is, you know, when we were much older, she's like, oh, I used to be a nun. And I'm like, <laughs> oh my. But then, you know, I also felt, I also felt like I would be intruding if I asked her why she left. So I never did. Mm-hmm. You know, I was like, are you happy now? She's like, oh yes, I'm happy. And I'm like, great. My foster father is actually, my foster father used to be oppressed. Wow. He's no longer oppressed. Oh my God. Oh no, he's... Happily married with four beautiful children. Wow. Mm-hmm. So, but th- I don't think that has anything to do with, you know. Your decision? Yeah, no, it has nothing to do with my decision. It has nothing to do with religion per se. It's their own opinions and, you know, choices per se to, to identify as and be different. But I most definitely became more spiritually aware three years ago. Mm-hmm. And so, because I, I mentioned I'm divorced happily divorced and I started meditating 
because I used to go through, I had bad anxieties, horrible, horrible anxieties and panic attacks. And mm. It was uneasy, couldn't have a day going and I would take CBDs, you know, to calm down. And then I, you know, sort of ventured into calming music. I actually recently listened to <laughs> your calming music that you posted on the podcast. But it wasn't music. Well, <laughs> it's calming. Listen, like... It was so calming, calming energy, you right. know, sound. But I started meditating a lot. And then I sort of realized my mind has so much power. Yeah. Like whatever I decide, I can be. You know, when you are just stuck in your mind, in the reality of your mind is you can shut everything else out and just stay present. Mm-hmm. And I learned the power of being present. Anxiety was caused because I didn't know what was going to happen tomorrow. There was so much anxiety. It's like, I have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. I'm going to wake up in a bad mood or in a happy mood or, you know, just being a parent. It was just difficult. Yeah. And so when I practiced and sort of got myself in a space where I understood how to control my mind and stay present, Listen, I don't care what's going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> I don't care what happened yesterday. Right. I am grateful for now. I am here. I have all of this. I have so much love around me. I have all this power to be what I want to be. Mm-hmm. It's so powerful. <laughs> I can tell even with the way how you speak with it. <laughs> It is, it is mind-blowing. And a friend of mine always talk about opening the third eye chakra. And, you know, the fact that you question about the third eye chakra. Yeah. It's, the third eye chakra is believed to be the... The, the, the third eye itself. Right, right on your forehead. The things people believe are demonic. <laughs> <laughs> Aligning your chakras, you know, and understanding how to heal your heart chakra. And the heart chakra for me has always been the hardest to heal because... I, I have a big heart and mm-hmm. I love, I love intensely. When I do things or anything at all, I do it intensely. My mom said it's a weakness that I have. It's a strength. <laughs> it is. She just, called it a weakness. It, it's, it, well, it's called a weakness because people take advantage of it. Exactly. Because people think that they can manipulate you into I'm being. just learning how to not believe the things people say. <laughs> Because for some reason, there is, I, I am still in the state where I want, when someone says, I'm going to do this, mm-hmm. that is what I take. That is what I perceive of what they say. There is nothing I'm going to suspect right. out of that. Right. If they're saying, I mean, there was a time when even we were in school, I think there were rumors about kids doing what. And for me, I don't want to go with rumors. So when I would ask a girl, are you really doing this? And to say, she says, I'm not. That is it. Right. So when I hear someone else, I'm like, she said she doesn't. <laughs> Do you? So I feel like I'm, I'm still a, a work in progress mm-hmm. where if someone says, okay, I know people tell lies, right. but there are some lies I don't expect, especially when it's about yourself. Mm-hmm. So, I... right. <laughs> because I don't have a reason. Some people lie even unprovoked, which, mm. which I find strange. Like, why are you? Like, it's, a, it's their strength, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's their strength. Like, who asked you? Mm. <laughs> why are you lying unprovoked? <laughs> people will surprise you. <laughs> so you've talked about the moment or the strength that you get from being present. Right. It's, and I see you create a lot of content. I mean, there's a whole group on Facebook. <laughs> Bloom, Bloom Here Now, or is it... Bloom Here Now. Or is it Gratitude with Kath? It's Bloom Here Now. The blog is Gratitude with Kath. And, you know, I, I was going to talk about devotion. Mm-hmm. Um, when you say that, you know, having a big heart is a weakness. Mm. It's devotion. And devotion is the same as grace. When you open yourself up for grace, you're opening yourself up for the unknown. So you get happiness, you get sadness, you get all sorts of emotions in between. But devotion, if you are not devoted, you simply aren't. It's not something that can be taught, right? So having a big heart is devotion. Mm -hmm. You simply are. You can't change that. 
I've ever prayed for a bad heart. <laughs> yeah, oh my God. It was, you know, you know, in the Catholic faith, we have like novenas. I don't know. I'm what? sure. Novenas. You don't know them? What are those? <laughs> <laughs> there are prayers for a specific period. Oh. So I think the most, the most common ones are nine days. So I remember I was going through a heartbreak and I cried so much. And I was like, God, I'm asking you for a bad heart because... People are strange. <laughs> I want to be them. Oh, I want, no. I, I really needed it because I felt like I think it needs to protect me. I prayed and prayed and it didn't work. And I was like, okay, I've given up. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, prayers are like manifestations. It failed. <laughs> Mine did. <laughs> My, no. I think I wasn't serious enough to pull up the energy. <laughs> oh, I gave up because I think I, I go to a place like, okay, I'm wasting time. <laughs> Let me find something else to pray for. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I've learned to pray for learning how to protect myself mm-hmm. from some things. Mm-hmm. I see I see stuff from far right now. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> Not here. <laughs> yeah, sometimes people say some, some stuff and I'm like, <laughs> I don't oh. believe you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Bloom Here Now, Gratitude with Kath. Mm. Two things, two in one. Two in one. Mm-hmm. Tell us about that. Gratitude. How did you come to a place of, of gratefulness? I've always been a grateful person. Um, and this is something that I'm very, very proud of myself. You know, to have come to understand gratefulness, to be thankful for the things that I have, for the person that I am, for the people that I meet, for every experience that I go through, bad or good, mm-hmm. I'm grateful. Because when you are grateful, you essentially open yourself up for more. Yeah. When you're not grateful, you're always wondering when, how, where. When you're grateful, why? why? The why is bigger, by the way. <laughs> I'm terrified of whys. I never ask why anymore. <laughs> I never do. Yeah. When, when something happens to me, I don't, I don't question the universe. I'm like, oh, thank you. What's coming next? Like, I'm ready. Mm-hmm. I'm grateful and I am ready. What else are you preparing me for? You know, and then there's the, why do I have to go through so much yeah. to get to this? The reason why we're focused on why am I in so much pain? Why am I feeling this? Listen, I'm not perfect. I am not perfect. And I would never tell anyone that perfection is the key. We can thrive for it, mm-hmm. but it's, it's impossible. So stay perfectly flawed. Yeah. Stay perfectly flawed. And in the process of staying flawed, it doesn't mean you should always do wrong. Mm. You know the difference between wrong and right. Do the best that you can. And this is how I do it. I do the best that I can. And when I don't understand something, I ask questions. Right. So that I can understand. it. And, you know, it brings you back to being grateful. Mm -hmm. When you're grateful, you receive more. When you're stuck in, I used to say this, right? Because I've been through so much, right? So I used to say, God, why? Mm -hmm. Why do I have to go through so much pain? just to feel a little bit of joy. Then when I changed my why to, what are you preparing me for? Oh yeah. You know, I'm very curious to see what this is going to be like. You know, go back home and cry. All right, shade it out, let it out. What next? Yeah, what is coming? I'm so excited. Like what is coming for me? You know, am I ready for it? Can I handle it? (laughs) You know, with so much excitement. Yeah. And I teach my daughter this as well. She came back from school one morning and she's like, well, you know, the other kids are laughing at me because my hair looks funny. And I told her and I said, what do their hair looks like? Well, their hair is long and, you know, their hair is white and blonde. And I'm like, well, yours is very curly, very beautiful. I don't see why you're trying to compare yourself. She's like, I'm not. They were just laughing at me. And I'm like, why? Why do you think they were laughing at you? Mm -hmm. She's like, well, because theirs is different. I'm like, that's exactly why. Because people question what they do not understand. You are empowering these kids. I have to. Mm -hmm. I have no choice but to, you know. And so every day when she goes to school 
And her friends are like, why is your hair like that? She's like, it's beautiful, isn't it? You like it. (laughs) And then they have nothing to say to it. They're like, yeah, it's different. I'm like, just because it's different doesn't mean that it's not good. Mm -hmm. Just because you don't understand something doesn't mean that it's not good. Right, 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 right. You know, that criticizing voice that's always in our heads about, you know, why am I going through so much pain? Why is this intense and this intensely happened when you know my divorce started Mm -hmm. when I decided to go through my divorce and I was like why am I going through so much pain I'm a good woman I am a great mother I'm a good friend I'm a great sister I'm a great daughter why do I have to go through so much pain and when I kept on asking why my pain basically doubled it just intensified right it was like oh you want more huh (laughs) (laughs) we're here I was like, yeah. We're here. <laughs> you know? And then I changed it. And I was like, huh, why is this happening for me? Could there be more? Mm-hmm. And I am telling you, I am so happy. Yeah. I am extremely happy. I could never have asked for anything different than how it happened. Right. You know? And so, but when I opened up to writing, you know, Gratitude with Kath, I was sharing with a friend on how much gratitude means to me. And, you know, she, she's blessed. She's very happy. She's got a good home. And she was just bickering. You know, I call it bickering because she was avoiding to see what exactly was up under her nose. She was looking farther. Mm-hmm. She said, well, no, I'm not happy. I need this. And I'm like, stay grounded. Like, look, look at what you have. You have a home. There are people who don't have homes. Right. You have two beautiful children. There are mothers who are struggling to just have one child. Stay grounded. and Or present. even hope to right. you know, at least have something grow. And even if it just leaves, at least right. not tried. Right. And, you know, and then it hit me that there are a lot of people that are fortunate, but they don't realize how fortunate they are. Mm-hmm. But there are also people that are struggling. Mm-hmm but don't realize that there's always light at the end of that tunnel. And so why am I sitting on all of this that I'm aware of? So I will share as much as I can when I can. And this is not for anyone else, but for me. Mm -hmm. But if anyone else feels it, if it speaks to you, I am glad that it got to you. And I'm grateful that you get to bloom with me, (laughs) you know, and get to blossom where you are planted because Exactly where you are sitting, no matter how painful it is, bloom in it. Yeah. Cry if you want to cry. If you're angry, make sure you watch your thoughts. Don't speak to yourself when you're angry because you're listening. The mm, thought of, oh, I'm mm, fat. Mm, mm, you know, you're mm, sitting there and you're mm. like, I am fat. Oh my God, look at these rolls. <laughs> <laughs> you're hitting someone. <laughs> I didn't tell you to bring it here. No, I, I, I did that. I did that to myself. Yeah. You know, like you're, you're sitting there like, oh my God, I'm fat. And, but then there's this projection of what perfection looks like, what a beautiful woman should look like. So if anyone tells me I'm fat, like, do you have a problem with yourself? Are you all right? Why are you pointing fingers at my flaws? You think I'm not aware? I am very aware of my problems. And I am working on it. Are you working on yours? Mm, mm, mm. You know, and this goes to bullies. I swear, God, I I do not like bullies at all. I actually feel for bullies. I want to hug them. They're struggling. When I see a post like by a bully, I want to go hug them. They're struggling. Like you need a (laughs) hug. Yeah. (laughs) Like, can I hug you? Listen, you are enough. You are loved. You need to love yourself. You are enough. Don't go out there looking for some power by trying to demean someone else and making them feel less of themselves than they already do. Duh, we all have demons. (laughs) I don't need you to scream it out loud. (laughs) It's okay. You've talked about gratitude and the need of being present and also blooming where you are planted Mm -hmm. in that particular moment. And I feel like you have tapped into how positive that is on someone's mental health. Mm -hmm. But besides that, is there something that you get to do to take care of your mental health? So I mentioned speaking to yourself in a positive manner because you're listening. You're always listening. Mm -hmm. So when you sit back, you know, and this is one of my favorite quotes, right? Always, always watch the words that you speak when you're alone. Because you're actually listening. When you sit back and you're like, I'm a failure. 
you're going to wake up every day thinking you are a failure. When you wake up and you're like, oh, today's going to be a great day. I'm a good person. I'm a great person. I'm a great boss. I'm a great employee. I'm I can a great do- podcaster. Excuse right. you. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> You know, your yeah. attitude for the day starts from when you wake up. And so speaking to yourself in a kind manner, we can't say that we treat people better if we can't treat ourselves better. Preach. I cannot say that I love you, Nabuguzi, if I don't love myself. Preach. Honey, I love myself. Mm-hmm. I love myself. And I wake up every day and I am grateful for me. And I say, I love you. There used to be a time when if someone said, if they looked at themselves and they said, I love me, that it was a boastful thing. There are people who are full of themselves. Yeah. That's a whole different scenario. (laughs) Yeah. Right. But when you are not full of yourself, you open yourself up for grace. You can love yourself and love others in the same manner. With right. humility, and that is a rare thing. Mm-hmm. But that starts with you. And so, you know, my practice, at least, is I speak to myself every morning. When I every woke up morning. this morning, like I had a hard time waking up today. <laughs> I had a really hard time waking up. You know, at some point I was like, wait, did she get the date? <laughs> oh my God, I hope she saw the date. <laughs> I did, and I was like, oh, 43 minutes to now go see. Okay, we'll make this. We will make this happen. You know, and and I spend the first hour being grateful for me because I am a powerful force. Mm -hmm. I make a big impact on myself before anyone else and then others. Right, right, right. And so I have to value myself just as much as I value someone else because when you do not value yourself, you think of other people as better than you. We're equals. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have your strength and yes, you do certain things better than I can, but we're not very different. We're just gifted differently. And what lesson or something, words of advice that you would want to leave for the person listening into this episode? (sighs) What do you want them to walk? They they have collected so much because this episode, friend, (laughs) like from minute one to... We didn't have a we didn't have a moment of no. rest. <laughs> so, is there something something extra that you would want them to walk away with? Forgive yourself. You have to forgive yourself. Let it go. Let go of all that anger. Let go of all that resentment. Because the people that you are thinking that you're angry at or you can't forgive, including yourself, don't care. So, you have to be the bigger person to remove yourself from that vacuum of pain. And just say, listen, I am enough. I am loved. Even if you're just speaking it for yourself, I am enough. I am loved. And I am more than what I think I am today. Mm -hmm. Now I am grateful because if you're grateful, you receive more. You have to be. You, you, You cannot say that you don't have enough. And of course, it's never enough, right? But it's, but it's only never enough because you're not grateful enough for what you already have, you know? And, I really hope you heal. I really hope you heal. I hope you forgive yourself. And I hope that you learn to love yourself. And I hope that you put yourself first. Mm -hmm. It is hard. It is hard for givers too. And it was very hard for me. But when you take care of yourself, you're able to take care of other people. And I'm mostly worried about people who struggle to look at themselves as an equal to others. You know, you think other people are better than you because what? They drive nice cars. Mm -hmm. Because what? You think you know how much they earn because of how much they spend? It's just an exterior. Right. You have right. no idea right. the battles right. they are fighting. And so just because you see someone smile doesn't mean that there is perfection. Mm-hmm. Be kind to yourself. It starts with yourself. So you're loved. <laughs> Can you take the podcast now? Yeah. You want to own it? You want me? Oh, you want me? No. Oh my God, no. <laughs> I cannot do what you do, Nabukuzi. I am so grateful for you. Stop it. (laughs) Catherine, thank you so much for giving us your time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm very, very honored. You have filled me today. I have. Mm -hmm. (laughs) See, that's a blessing. (laughs) My takeaway from this episode is be kind to yourself. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Hashtag with Nabuguzi Chuanuke. If you loved what you heard, make sure you subscribe to Hashtag with Nabuguzi Chuanuke in your podcast platform of choice and make sure that you share it with... 
hey, make sure, make sure you share it with your friends, loved ones, and every other person you believe is affected by the millennial world around us. Also, feel free to share your insights about what connected with you on social media and be sure to tag us we are at hashtag we know Guzichwanka on facebook and instagram and on twitter our handle is at htnk podcast endeavor to check out our app ep- not episode i'm addicted to episodes endeavor to check out our website navguzichwanka.com for more insightful conversations catch you next week and until then remember to be kind to yourself